And now it's time for The Moral Maze with Michael Burke. Good evening. It's now clear that an agonising reappraisal of the racial attitudes of this country and its institutions is well underway. It stems in large part, of course, from the death of Stephen Lawrence, a black teenager killed by a gang of young whites in South London. The police badly mishandled the case and stand accused not just of incompetence but of racism and institutional racism, not an easy thing to define, at that. The report of the inquiry into the case goes to the Home Secretary next week. It's being described as the most significant document on British race relations since the Scarman report on the Brixton riots a generation ago. In the meantime, articles, surveys, reports fly thick and fast. Many concentrate on the police, on their attitudes and recruitment, on how they're five times more likely to stop a black man than a white man, for instance. Today, how the Home Secretary is to instruct Chief Constables to recruit three times the present number of blacks and Asians to try to counter what's described as a racist canteen culture. This week, the Commission for Racial Equality has charted a worrying rise in racial incidents. But does that mean we are more prejudiced or more sensitive to the issue, more inclined to define a crime as racially motivated? This week also, the left-leaning Institute for Public Policy Research draws wider conclusions about the state of our race relations and makes more controversial recommendations. Britain, it says, is going through a national identity crisis. Laws against discrimination are not enough. The government must campaign for multiculturalism, up to and including a new team of Whitehall spin doctors to counter negative stories in the media. The assumption is that reinforcing multiculturalism, encouraging our differences, is per se a good thing. But is it? Would that create more trouble than it solves, stoke up the politics of grievance? Racism is wrong, no question there. Other traditions must be tolerated, respected. Few decent people would quarrel with that. But is there a case for saying that we should be concentrating on what unites rather than divides us, encouraging minorities to understand and participate in the culture of the majority? Is that a better route to understanding, acceptance, equality? Multiculturalism, is it possible? Is it desirable? Our moral maze tonight. Our regular panel, Professor Ian Hargreaves, the editor and commentator, Janet Daly of The Telegraph, the constitutional historian, Dr David Starkey, and Dr David Cook, the medical ethicist from Oxford. Ian Hargreaves. Well, the straight answer to your question, Michael, is that we can't have a society based upon understanding and acceptance if, as individuals, we are unable to be confident that our differences will be respected. A truly multicultural society can both celebrate difference and achieve unity. That's why those shameful statistics of racial obstruction challenge us to act. 2% of police officers, 1.5% senior civil servants from ethnic minorities, it's no good. Black people, as you said, five times more likely to be stopped and searched. That's worse. It doesn't feel like a moment of complacency to me. Janet Daly? I'm perfectly happy with the notion of a multiracial society, a multi-faith society, or a multi-ethnic society, but a multicultural society is a contradiction in terms. Because without a dominant or a mainstream cultural identity, there isn't a society. There's just a conglomeration of disparate people who happen to occupy the same landmass. A culture is a set of shared values and references, and it's a sense of historical continuity, which gives a collection of people some sort of cohesion, some coherent sense of itself. From that position of confident identity, the society can be tolerant of differences and diversity. Without it, there's a vacuum that can be filled only by the conflict of tribal loyalties and chronic moral insecurity. David Cook. Well, racism is a kind of universal problem. We're all racist, but that's not an excuse for individual prejudice, nor for the way that institutions can foster and support destructive attitudes. But the cure isn't government campaigns or a new role for spin doctors or even accentuating cultural differences. I think rather we need to reinforce our common humanity and our common commitment to working to build a community where we can live and work together, secure, free from fear, free from discrimination. David Starkey. I found your introduction, Michael, rather curious. It asked, is multiculturalism a good thing? Is it something we've choices about? We have it. London is quite extraordinary. It's a unique world cosmopolis. It's there. But it's happened, as most things have happened in Britain, by accident, in a confused and random fashion. I began by hating the idea. I've come round really rather to liking it. But what I don't want is the equivalent of multicultural planning controls. The idea of the state muscling in, defining it, legislating it and enforcing it, that I find as true British, absolutely terrible. 
Panel, thanks very much indeed. Our first witness is Yasmin Alibi Brown, no stranger to this uh, programme, of course, uh, and the author of that Institute for Public Policy Research uh, report, which is called True Colours Public Attitudes to Multiculturalism and the Role of Government. She's also a columnist on The Independent. Uh, Yasmin, um, Britain, a national identity crisis? Yes. <clears throat> and How um, so? Well, I think because of devolution and I think inevitable independence, I think the anxieties over Europe, and I think one of the, the, the um, kind of after effects or joint effects of what we think is happening and we vaguely call globalization, I think even people who felt secure once within themselves are beginning, and like the English, I mean, it's very interesting to talk to the English these days, how they're getting quite worried about who they are and their ethnicity, quite rightly, and their rights to an identity. So I think there is a, it's not an exaggerated crisis, nothing is ever that exaggerated in this wonderful country, but I think it's there. But is the answer to this um, uh, national identity crisis really, uh, uh, I mean, at the risk of overemphasizing certain elements of your recommendations, lots of new Labour type uh, spin doctors rebranding us as a multicultural Britain? No, the, I mean, uh, the whole book is actually laying responsibility at the heart of government and whether it's it's new labor or not is irrelevant to me really i was categorizing uh, the spin doctors and the influence on the media and so yeah, on well, one aspect uh, that, of that is one aspect of it but what i'm interested in is that you know 50 years ago a ship arrived and changed the society in a fr profound and fundamental way and i think david stark is absolutely right that it happened in a confused and ad hoc way there's only one thing i agree with enoch powell about and that was that the people were never asked and the people were never led. And I think that was unfair and it's time to lead. Janet Daly, your witness. Do you think, is it that it's possible that your demand that white British identity transform itself in response to the presence of ethnic minorities could add to racial tension rather than detract from it? I've not asked the British uh, white population to transform its identity. I've asked for white Britons to have a sense of nationhood which embraces people that actually it's not just them but we have for too long been referred to as people and ethnic minorities kind of fringe people i want the shape of that nation to change not for people to give up who they are yeah and i totally agree with what you said in your intro that there is a, a need for core values and actually the book recommends that very strongly right um but you say this is i'm reading from the press release for, for your report um it, it you say that your report argues that one solution to this is a strategic project to rebrand multicultural britain as an inclusive concept which embraces diversity and values and so on um surely uh, it's a non sequitur to say that we have to rebrand multicultural Britain, but on the other hand, um, we can respect the diversity and values no, of... I've never <clears throat> multiculturalism has become a euphemism for not white. No, and that that's it, not the way it's, I was using but, it, actually, no, But that's okay. the way mm -hmm. most people in this... It's not true of the United States. It's used very mm -hmm. differently in the United States. In this country, ethnic minorities and multiculturalism have been used in a very narrow way. So what I wanted to do was to say that multiculturalism is actually about all of us. Um, point number one. Point number two, that within that, not all cultures in all its forms need to be respected. I mean, if anybody reads my columns in The Independent, there are lots of things within cultures that do need changing. And I can't live as if I never moved. But sorry, who is to say? Who is to make that judgment? I think we have to work at it together. Now, the example I used in, in the book is Canada. I was very impressed with Canada, because the deal there is, you can retain your ancestral connections and your, your cultural heritage, as long as it doesn't break fundamental principles, right. core values. Right. Um, but tell me, on, the more, on a broader abstract principle, do you think that the answer to the problem of racism lies in more assimilation or more separatism? No. Which? You know, no, it's not a question no, of I, yes no, or no. It's, it's not, I, it lies in neither. I don't believe in assimilationism. You haven't assimilated and I haven't assimilated. We seem to, you know, you, you okay. sound as American as you probably did a long time ago. And I haven't assimilated. But what I, you have done and I have done is integrated, and I think that's quite a different thing. Integration is retaining a bit of who you are and where you came from, but at the same time buying into a majority but, culture. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, it just strikes me that the tone of your attitude toward ethnic minority people seems extraordinarily patronising. I am I mean, of the ethnic my, minority uh, people. Me too. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean, I, I, it, it doesn't seem to me that the uh, particularly your ethnic minority, and maybe my ethnic minority, need very little extra 
help in the kinds of ways that you seem to be suggesting? I mean, can I suggest you just uh, the figure that the highest achieving group in the school system in Britain now are Asian girls, closely followed by African girls and boys, achieving higher than English girls. But they're nowhere girls. to be fine, found in the top 10% top of our... Oh, sorry, that's not true. No, it's, not, it's absolutely the PSI report made that very clear. The PSI report showed that the top 10... Level, the level right at the top is still totally underrepresented. Janet, I'm going to have to interrupt this uh, delightful uh, but rather individualistic <laughs> conversation here to let David Starkey, for it is he, uh, onto the scene. The reason, of course, that they're not in the 10% is because they're in the schools and in 20 yes. or 30 years it, they will be in the top time. percent. Of course it's, it's true. true. But um, it's let's, true. let's go to this whole question of culture and how we define it. Uh, Tell me if I've got this wrong, but as I understood it in your report, you wanted us to start copying the American habit and start referring to people as Caribbean Britons yes. or Chinese Britons. Because I don't like the term ethnic minority. So I think it do doesn't demand enough of me and it doesn't make me a part of the nation the way I would want it to be a part of this nation. But I'm not English and I don't want to lose myself either. So I have this little problem as I am English. Am I an English... Britain? Yes. A British Britain? A British Englishman, yes, because no longer can, an Eng can English just mean British, of course. I am deeply aware of that. Therefore, of course, oh, the, therefore, oh, of course, therefore, of course, the very interesting question is going to be, as you said, when the British Isles break up and England becomes England again, yes. where do blacks fit well, in Well, I've claimed London for us. As a multiracial state. A multi uh, this right. is where all the mixed race people, Let the people with no other place to go to Let's become. just pursue this cultural idea a little bit further. What is your view on what for a long time has been the practice of those who control adoption? That black children for adoption must be brought up by black I parents. I don't agree with it at all. You do not agree with that? I don't agree that. with that because I, I'm a profound integrationist. I am, if anything turns my stomach, it is any kind of separatist politics or the assumption that being black makes you a saint. And I've written this extensively, even within the last month, that, you know, just being black doesn't make you a good parent, for what? example. What? Is it possible for whites to be subject to racial discrimination? Yes. So the yes. English in Scotland of apparently could be? Yes. You have no problem with that? No. And I think it is because those experiences are happening that actually, in a strange way, understanding seems to be growing about exactly what, is, what can happen to a community. A final question, because obviously lots of other people want to get in. Is it, in your vision of the world, going to be permissible to argue against multiculturalism yes. as an ideal? Yes, of course. I mean, the arguments will always go on. In the end... So I, I could argue for yeah. the authenticity and need to preserve the independence, traditions, self-identity of being white English. Can I, I do that yes, in your Yes, I world? wrote a, an article in the New Statesman saying exactly that. We had to nurture and encourage that. <laughs> in that case, yes, but what's all this about? <laughs> this is all I mean, about mutual is, respect, actually, no, of Janet. Course, but we, none of us would disagree with that. No, yes, but none of us would. would disagree. None of no, us no, no. would. Hang on, hang on. But what you seem to be doing throughout this report is increasing the self-consciousness of separate ethnic identity. No, I'm not. No, sure. Oh, surely. It's not a separate ethnic identity. It is well, the British national identity no, that no, my book is about. No, no, but the British about. national identity as defined by all of its ethnic constituent elements which have to remain self, somehow culturally self-contained and maintain no, their integrity. No, I've never said that. I think you should read the book well, then again. Why? But, then it, but then there's no... The book would need, wouldn't have needed to it be It does, written. because I think the solutions that we've, you, we've come up with at the moment have created divisions. And that's what I'm trying to contradict. And the kind of self-consciousness that you're advocating doesn't in no, this division? No, no. Yasmin, just to briefly interrupt, uh, uh, what, <laughs> what <laughs> are you asking? In me. one sentence, what are you asking the government to do? I think I'm I just asking the government there, to have a sentence. bit more vision than, uh, than most governments have had so far. You know, we are a complex, very m m complex, mixed uh, democracy, and we are being governed in the way as if the wind rush never arrived. And that's all I'm asking. Yasmin Alibi Brown, thanks very much indeed. If you want to know more, follow the collected thoughts of Yasmin Alibi Brown in various <laughs> columns in the New States from the Independent and from the Institute of Public, for Public Policy Research. Yasmin, thanks a lot. Uh, next witness is Gerald Hartrup, who's director of the, um, of the Freedom Association. Um, do you regard this as a racist society? 
Um, there is racism within this society, but I regard it as, I think, the historically the most successful multiracial society that's ever existed. You don't see problems in the police, for instance? Yes, uh, I see uh, problems in the police. Did the, uh, some of the things that came out of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, for instance, uh, worry you, concern you from, from the particular viewpoint you have? Yes, they do, they do concern me, but what also concerns me is um, some of the evidence given by people. Um, I'm concerned, for example, that some black groups um, urge um, black people not to join the police force. Um, it takes two to tango and um, the Home Secretary's desire to increase the number of um, black and Asian police officers is, uh, is very important uh, but will be frustrated unless the leaders of the black community get behind that and say join the police force. Ian Hargreaves, is your witness. Uh, Mr Hartrup, do you think that we are as a society less racist than we were say 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Yes. Um, uh, uh, closeness makes for understanding of of other people um, but indeed our very closeness may cause problems for example in London people will um, work together play together marry but their very um, proximity to one another may increase tensions as well so you've got a, a dynamic in society where things may appear to get worse but, whereas in fact they're better but you agree that they have got better do you think that any action taken by any government in the last 20 or 30 years has helped that process of things getting better? Hmm. No. I think ethnic minorities, um, people who've come to this country, uh, have had a remarkable success story. So you were an opponent of the race equality laws in this no, country? No, I was not an opponent of the race equality well, laws. Well, how does that uh, fit with your previous answer? Sorry? You, you said that you, were, you thought that nothing that government had done in the last 30 years had made a positive contribution. If you're asking me now how the Race Relations Act, for example, has worked, I see gross defects in it. I see problems that indeed it um, patronises ethnic minorities. But were you of... opposed to its existence in the first place? No. So why have you changed your mind about it? Well, um, I am concerned at, um, at the ineffective operation of the Race Relations Act that it sometimes causes difficulties where no difficulties exist. For example, um, you see adverts in newspapers which are racially restrictive. We do have a colour bar in this country. We have a colour bar courtesy of the Race Relations Act and Section 5 2 But the, of the central Race purpose, Act. or one of the central purposes of the Race Relations Laws is to prevent racial discrimination in advertising for jobs, for example. Now, I'm not denying that sometimes those rules are circumvented, but are you arguing that the rules are a good idea or a bad idea? I can't understand. I, I believe, actually, that um, ethnic minorities are discriminated against, um, often because of fear, and that, that the, um, the Race Relations Act puts fear into the, uh, into the minds of employers. You've, David Cook, you've agreed that there is, in fact, a problem, racism. Now, I'm interested in what you think is the cure, because it's been suggested earlier in the programme that what we ought to have is the government uh, really having a campaign, spin doctors at work, and even today the Home Secretary is talking about targets. Mm. So is this the way to overcome racism, then? Government spin doctors, or, for example, the Commission for Racial Equality, who have been the spin doctors for the last 20 years, are absolutely disastrous. Michael announced that the CRE had discovered increasing um, racial di um, racially motivated incidents. The CRE has kept back the fact that white people are subject to much, many more racially motivated incidents than, than blacks. But what um, are you going to put in its place, though? Sorry, I, I must continue this point. The Home Office at the moment has just published a paper which says that something like 130,000 racially motivated incidents were directed against ethnic minorities. And this paper has gone to Parliament without pointing out that some 240,000 racially motivated incidents are directed against Against, uh, against whites. But to now be fair we, to the CRE, they actually do mention how many incidents there are and look at the proportions. But I'm interested in what the, the cure to be fair is going to be if you're not going uh, to accept sorry, the CRE I'm, I'm saying, to be fair to the CRE, the latest CRE pamphlet only mentions 130,000 racially motivated incidents directed against ethnic minorities to prove that ethnic minorities get a very raw deal in this country. And they don't put in the full figures. So they what have are you going had to the put full in the figures place, in, then? You sorry? still haven't told me what you're going to put in place of the CRE, how are you going to overcome the racism which you admit does exist and is a problem? For well, example, I... in the police force, what are you going to do about that? The fact that there are not large numbers of uh, ethnic minority people, none hardly in the senior ranks, and under-representation in all ranks. What do you do about it? Well, first of all, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I would take a very tough line 
um, I believe in sacking quickly, sacking people. If in fact you, there is evidence of uh, of racism, you sack people. You don't have these long drawn out. Um, um, and to do that, you have to have a law, and the law then has to say that this is a grounds on which you I can don't sack think people. So. I think that in, in any decent organisation, if in fact you behave in a racist manner, it's a reason for sacking you. Can I ask you briefly what you think about the basic thrust of the initial question at the start of this programme? Uh, that we should be uh, encouraging, fostering uh, multiculturalism uh, and putting the emphasis there as opposed to putting the emphasis on encouraging uh, minorities to understand and participate in, uh, in, 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 in the majority culture in the country. Well, nobody's completely right on this issue. I share some of the views of Yasmin Alibi Brown. But what I would say is that um, I, uh, I live in a multiracial society. I live in a multicultural society to an extent. But I believe that cultures are competitive. We take the best that comes. And we have been able to gain something from the cultures that have come to us. But we take the best and we reject the worst. David one very quick question. The Home Secretary seems to be arguing now that he wants to have black policemen in areas where there are hardly any black population. For example, my native counties, mm. Cumbria. Mm. Is that a good thing? I'm concerned. My, my, my area is London. I would like to see many more um, black policemen in, in London. For Cumbria, I believe People should be hired for their, um, for their ability to do the job. It is outrageous to, um, to hire somebody because of the colour of their skin. Gerald Hartup, thanks very much indeed. Our next witness is Gary McDowell, who's director of the uh, Institute of United States Studies, professor of American studies. Professor McDowell, um, uh, would it be too simplistic to say the astonishing success America had in assimilating successive waves of immigration was because of their willingness, uh, even eagerness, to become Americans. Well, I think that's absolutely right. The grand theory of the melting pot, that anybody and everybody could come to the shores, be assimilated, uh, work their way up from the bottom, and I think it was largely, uh, in no small part, that America was always a classless society. There were never those distinctions. We were all immigrants at one time. Uh, uh, and is it perhaps less the case now, and is that creating problems? I, I don't think it's less the case I explicitly. I mean, part of the problem is exactly what we're talking about here with this report. Uh, there's a very divisive quality to public policy that seeks to celebrate separateness in the name of bringing people together. And over the past 25 or 30 years, you've seen that in American politics. You've seen affirmative action. You've seen all kinds of uh, uh, plans for ethnic diversity, multicultural education, and all the rest that has resulted in what the liberal historian Arthur Schlesinger has called the retribalization of ethnic groups in America. And uh, what do you think are the implications of this? What have been the consequences of it? Have they been good or bad? Oh, I think they've been bad. I think that, uh, as a general matter, American politics has been torn asunder by this effort to transcend the problem of race and racial discrimination. Uh, good intentions always lead to bad places. And uh, uh, I think America should be a lesson to what Britain's about to embark upon. David Cook, your witness. I have two kinds of experiences of the United States that I'm finding hard just to match up. One was that uh, back in 67, 68, I worked with uh, War and Poverty program with the Black Power Movement and their cure was total separation. I just came back from Texas and they are the problem of Hispanic Americans and, and sadly they're often not Americans that are actually wanting to maintain their Hispanic culture and there's no integration, there's no real melting pot. It's a dog's dinner. No, I think that's right, that uh, the ethnic groups themselves have become increasingly resistant to the idea of assimilation, that it's the separate culture, the celebration of that culture and within a diverse country like America that's okay, but when you take that at the expense of seeking those things which knit people together with a common tie of society, you lose something. A nation has to be more, has to be something beyond the sum of its ethnic parts. So what does that mean if you try to translate it into the British scene? What's the nature of assimilation or integration that will give us a model which is a way forward? Well, I think the one thing that America has been successful at is passing very vigorous civil rights laws that protect the rights of individuals when they are uh, confronted with racism, when they're discriminated against, to allow them to go to court to bring the full power of the American government to bear on those institutions that uh, prohibit them one way or the other from full participation. So it's government campaigns and spin doctors then? No, no, it's, uh, it's courts of law. Janet Daly? 
When my um, Russian Jewish grandparents wanted to become naturalized American citizens, they had actually to take an examination in English to prove that they could read and write English. They had to take an exam on the Constitution, a written exam, um, and they had to pass, they had to, in fact, go for intensive evening courses to prepare for these exams. Now, that's largely been dropped in the United States. There isn't that need any longer to prove that you're fluent in English and so on, and that you understand the Constitution. Do you think that that's been a retrogressive step to drop those barriers? Oh, I think absolutely. I mean, I remember even as a, uh, an American-born white child having to study the Constitution mm, to get out of eighth grade. Me too. And yes. if you didn't pass it, you would still be there the next year. And I think any of those things that are designed to bring people together in common sense of purpose as a nation are absolutely essential, especially for immigrants, when they arrive there to make them feel a part of a great nation and that great nation's history. David Stocking? You, in response to David Cook here, talking about government spin doctors, said what we need is law. And throughout this program, we've been talking very much in terms of a society that's operated on from outside. But you're an American living in Britain. Wouldn't you say, honestly, searching your heart, that blacks are on the whole better treated here, more integrated, and more part of the mainstream than they are in your own dear country? Well, one thing that strikes me here is the lack of black separate culture exactly. that I see in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I've gone, I've lived here now for six years. When I've gone back, the one thing I sense when I travel around the United States is a great development of a black middle class whose values are indistinguishable from my own. And that's an important factor. And it's an important factor because they feel a part. I think I would agree with you strongly, but can I press you in another area? Because we we're just constantly talking about law, marriage. Do you know what the statistics for intermarriage are in America? I'm afraid I don't. They're very low. Here, they're very high. Mm -hmm. And it's not only a black culture, there's a black English in America, whereas here you hear black boys talking thick Yorkshire, thick Cockney, and you have this wonderful, extraordinary phenomenon of Asians talking deep Bradford. <laughs> or if that's on assimilation, I don't know what it is. <laughs> Ian Hargreaves. I'd like to just explore what you think the connection is between what I'm sure is the fact of a strong and growing black middle class in America and not here. You know, why is the president's chief of staff, Vernon Jordan, a black man, unthinkable that anybody in a position of such prominence in any area of public life really in Britain... Paul Watting? Uh, nowhere near that level of importance. Oh, but he hasn't been in America. Uh, uh, can we, can we, can we, have been around in America longer uh, than here. Yeah, can we listen to the, the witness? Can we listen to the witness, please, Ian? Carry on. The, the, the question is, what connection do you make between the legal arrangements which you've described and the that the emergence of that middle class? How helpful has it been for people to break some of the barriers which clearly exist? Looking at the British statistics, it can't be denied. Well, I mean, I think the important thing in America to distinguish between is law that preserves the freedom and the rights of individuals and laws that are designed to give special preference to racial or ethnic groups. Those laws have been disastrous. What has allowed the emergence of a black middle class is precisely those laws that they could go to court and say, I'm a man or I'm a woman of perfect merit, I have an ability, and you're telling me I can't do this because I'm black? That's against the law. And they would be forced into allowing them to do that. It's that opening up of institutions that theretofore had been closed through the instrumentality of civil rights law and harsh law and vigorous enforcement by the Justice Department that allowed them to gain access to those institutions that turned them into American citizens in a full sense of the word. So when Mr. Hartrup tells us that he can't think of a single uh, useful thing that government has been able to do about fostering a healthy, diverse cultural uh, society, he's wrong. Well, I would say that's, uh, that's overly simplistic. I would say it's important that you be able to secure the rights of the individuals, but not pander to the interests of the group. And in that spectrum between, uh, between emphasizing uh, the importance of the majority culture and people signing up to it, understanding it or whatever, and uh, if you like, encouraging and glorying in diversity, uh, I mean, it's a trade-off, it's a compromise, isn't it? But where is the ideal place on that spectrum in your, in your view? Well, I mean, I think America in its own way is kind of a celebration of that uh, reconciliation of the demands for independent rights on the one hand and ethnic diversity on the other. You go to any major city and some of the most popular places are Chinatown and uh, all the other places to go for restaurants. They have their enclaves, but yet they're not denied access to the other parts of that society. Uh, and I think that you have to look upon any ethnic group as having a certain natural pride in its roots, and that's totally legitimate. But there are other things that demand that they be a part of a greater whole. Gary McDowell, thanks very much indeed. Our last witness is Lee Jasper, 
uh, who's um, a founder member of, of the Black Caucus. He's chairman of the National Black Alliance. He's executive member of the National Assembly Against Racism. He's director of the 1990 Trust, which is a, a national black organization to, to promote good race relations. Actually, I'm tempted to ask you, is there any organization of this kind that you didn't found a chairman <laughs> of or a, a driving force behind? <laughs> <laughs> is all this because you think you're living in a racist society? Absolutely. I think that uh, I'm uh, conscious of and uh, uh, recent Home Office research indicates that there are still major tranches of areas of social policy, uh, services, uh, employment uh, and policing and criminal justice that have uh, major impacts uh, and reflect uh, disproportionate uh, numbers of, of uh, black people, either as uh, victims of crime or, or, or suspects. Uh, Do you see this as a collection of, uh, how can I put this, of individual sort of racist attitudes or a collective institutionalised racism? Well, I think there's still a. You? I think there is still a, a colonial hangover in, in uh, abroad in Britain generally that uh, uh, affects pre you know gives effect to prejudice and uh, is manifest uh, in a variety of ways. I think there are some institutions that are uh, clearly worse than others in terms of the level of institutionalised racism that is existent within them. Uh, but that institutionalised uh, racism is alive and well. Is well, and is that. the way forward to promote multiculturalism or, or somehow uh, encourage? Uh, uh, ethnic and racial minorities to, to participate more in the mainstream culture? Well, I mean, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Uh, I think that certainly what I'm looking for as a black British uh, man is I don't want to be discriminated against. And if I have recourse to the law that says if I am discriminated against and it can be proven, I can get uh, that uh, uh, redress, uh, then I think that's as much as uh, uh, black people are looking for in the United Kingdom in relation to integration or so on and so forth. Everybody has said around this table, and it's quite right, that those things have a course and, uh, uh, of their own, and uh, it will be what it will be. Um, David Starkey. If you'll forgive me, I'm going to put to you some of the questions that I actually put to uh, Yasmin Ali by Brown and see whether your answers are the same as hers. I put to her a question about the practice until recently about adoption, the view that a black baby should have black parents to preserve its cultural inheritance. She said she disapproved of that. What's your view? My view is that uh, whilst wouldn't, uh, one wouldn't uh, agree with legislation banning it, uh, I think the guidelines should be uh, amended to make appropriate, and in fact in the Children's Act, it's still uh, part of the legislation. What was changed was the emphasis in the guidelines. But part of the legislation still says a hey, local authority will have due regard for a child's cultural background when seeking to make a placement. And where that, I think that's sensible uh, uh, approach. I didn't see any reasons to change it, given that we introduced the amendment at the time from our organisations. Um, so, I'm sorry, you're actually saying that you want a black baby to be brought up by black parents? Uh, what I think is... I think, basically, well, well, no, no, in a word. Well, well, well uh, you, you see, these things can't be explained in a word. I think that the cultural background of a child is a very important factor. And race defines place, that cultural background. Well, not necessarily, because a, a black child from African descent may not fit well in a Caribbean household. So it is culture uh, that indicates uh, the, you know, the importance of the placement. Would that apply to a white child? Well, of course. Well, I think it should apply to a white child. If you're going to send somebody from East I, End of London I've, I've got, to the I've Scottish got, I've Highlands, there may be difficulties. I've got interesting... In uh, well, indeed, that then leads me to my next question. Can a child from London, or anybody else going from London, going up to Scotland, in other words, white be a victim of racism. I'm sure that uh, they can be a victim of racism from uh, different nationalities who uh, may have uh, superior views and attitudes in relation so to outsiders. So you're then not surprised by the fact that the C uh, Commission of Racial Equality has discovered, as we've been told earlier in the programme, that the majority of racial attacks are on whites, not blacks, and therefore, presumably, black attacks on whites. I've, uh, I, I've, I keep hearing about the report. I have to say I've not seen it. I don't know uh, to what you were, are, are referring. And uh, to that extent, feel very difficult to comment. What I would say is in an area like Oldham, the chief superintendent of that area said that it's Bangladeshi communities attacking white communities. And when you go to Oldham and you speak to the Bangladeshis, they say they can't get their re racial attacks reported and taken up by the police. So I think we have to look very hard at those figures. Uh, David, Janet I, I want to return to your point, mm. David Stanker. It seemed to me that the force of what David Starkey was asking you about the adoption question is whether a newborn baby who presumably doesn't have a culture, at least not consciously, is, has to be defined by his skin colour. Is, is his cultural identity determined 
by his skin color? Does he have no choice, as it were, about what culture he will adopt, what culture he will integrate into? Well, in, in, as, fa in, in as much as color will influence people's perception of them, uh, then I think it's important. I think, I think, if I may answer the question, I think that although a child may be born uh, a cultural, if you like, that society, the society is born into, will have views about particular cultures, and the culture that is attributed to the child may well impact upon their life. Quite, but then in fact you're saying that you are choosing to reinforce that view. You're you're saying if everybody is going to look on you as an Afro-Caribbean or an African or whatever, then I want to reinforce that and see to it that you stay locked into that culture. Mm -hmm. I'm I think, I think successful minority cultures have inbuilt survival strategies that have allowed them to be successful. And with a particular child, you would want to ensure that those cultural survival strategies enabling them to navigate society but, and racism within it are imparted to the child. But you're saying that an individual doesn't have, isn't free to transcend whatever limitations are implied by the social perception I would of love, his I would love me and my family not to be dealing with racism but running a multi-million pound business. The fact of the matter is, is that the life opportunities of both me and my family as black Britons are substantively reduced. Now, whether I'm born of a free man uh, and then society imposes the prism of culture around me, I mean, we can debate, but at the end of the day, I want protection from that discrimination and I want child placement in, in adoption in culturally relevant families that can arm that child to survive that culture. Mr. Mr. Jaspers, you've mm. agreed that in the end everybody's racist, so what's your cure? I didn't say everybody was well, racist. I well, said, everybody has the capacity. You well, said black or white, it. it makes yes. no difference. So how are we going to root out racism then? What's your cure? Well, my my cure, uh, first and foremost, is to ban uh, and have uh, a tough legislation in relation to discrimination. That's what I want to do. Why is it that my children should be five times this, four times that, three times the other, and twelve times that, over and above or below that of an average British white citizen? But is it we the made, legislation made our or the application of the legislation? Pardon? Is it the legislation itself or the application of the legislation? Well, you need problem? strong, you need clear legislation to be applied. I think over seventy percent of the Race Relations Act has not, never been used in a court of law. David Starkey, we've got very little. Time. Mr. Jasper, do you agree with Jack Straw, who wants the police in areas of Britain where there is hardly a black face to have 7 or 10 percent of the police force black? I think that uh, increased black uh, membership of the police force would be a good thing. Even in areas where there are no blacks? Well, I don't see the, the, the issue that you make. I mean, we're not specifically joined the police force just to deal with black issues. They'll have to deal with all issues and regardless of what But shouldn't the police reflect their community? Isn't that why you want more black policemen? Um, I want more black policemen, but I also want the issue of institutionalised racism, which leads to a net drain on black officers leaving the force, dealt with before we have uh, uh, ideas about setting targets and quotas. It is self-defeating. Lee Jasper, thanks very much indeed. Um, can we just go back to the beginning of this programme, uh, uh, Janet Daly, when Yasmin Alibi Brown made such a... Uh, well, was it a telling point when she drew a, drew a distinction between assimilation and integration? I don't understand the distinction. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I, I know what she well, means. Well, I suppose the distinction. Well, I, I, I suppose the distinction is you lose. Uh, if, if you're assimilated, you perhaps lose connections with any background and traditions you might have had uh, by becoming British and losing, for instance, and, and losing all connections with the uh, with your past in the Caribbean. Well, that's not what I understood. But that's not what I understand by assimilation. I mean, um, members of my ethnic minority, Jewish children, are taught their culture in special Hebrew classes, which prepare them for bar mitzvah. And and at the same time, they're, as far as I'm concerned, completely assimilated into British society and, and function very successfully in British society. And I don't see the problem. And I don't see why other ethnic minorities can't take that path of kind of a dual sense of their cultural identity. But that doesn't doesn't seem to me to allow for the kind of separatism which, whether Yasmin admits it or not, it does seem to me that she is advocating. The idea of multiculturalism seems to suggest a whole series of, cu of cultures coexisting in some way under an umbrella, a loose kind of constitutional umbrella. I I didn't, he I didn't hear Yasmin Alibi Brown arguing for anything different mm. from what you have asked for and oh. lived in your own family, Janet. You began by saying that we had she a choice that we had a choice between either having one uh, dominant, uh, morally um, acceptable culture, uh, unchallenged, unthreatened by diverse cultures, and that we had to make that choice. If that were true, no dominant culture would ever be shifted, would ever evolve or amend itself. It's not the. <laughs> 
reality of the way that the world works. That's it's precisely what I wasn't saying. A mainstream culture can absorb changes. It's, but it's, but, but it's but changed not when by it's, it. But not when it's therefore so, changed by yes, it. It becomes when it's multicultural. So David, and Dave, threatened. David Starkey, you and, you and Janet Daly were making quite a big point of, uh, of, 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 of trying to get a couple of the witnesses to associate uh, colour with culture uh, and firmly uh, plant one on top of the other. Uh, what basically was the thrust of your argument there? I thought it was fairly clear. In practice, as Yasmin said, uh, what multicultural is used to do is to mean black and brown in this country. She was coming up with a far finer series of distinctions, whereas from Lee Jasper, we got the very simple equation. And the question on adoption, do you believe that a black child essentially must be brought up by black parents, is the litmus test of that. Um, and clearly, Jasper and uh, Alibi Brown represent radically different positions. And what worries me is that effectively we are seeing um, a country which, with a little bit of legit, with a little bit of, of government activism and very sensible, strong laws, and I would distinguish between law, as our American witness said, and government activism, I distinguish between the two, is actually doing rather well. And the idea that we have to plant black policemen in white Britain as a symbol of God knows what, I'm not sure, I think is likely to undo a great deal but of the But David, good that's uh, been what, done. what are you therefore saying should be done about the problem of police under recruitment of black people? And as Mr Jasper pointed out, the fact that the ones who are recruited quickly leave. What should be done is what we've been told should be done, is ruthless suppression of the canteen culture, that the police on the whole should reflect their local communities. We do not yet have, until new Labour legislators, a national police force, thank God. David Cook, lastly, did you have much to quarrel with, with the um, Alibi Brown analysis or the um, Alibi Brown solution, if it came to that? Well, I think that government, it, if we're going to move to law, and I was a little distressed that almost everybody seemed to think law was the answer. All that law does is give you a basic minimum standard, a safety net. Actually, if you look at the black middle class in the United States, it's economics that's made the difference. Mm, that's what's absolutely. given them the uplift. Mm -hmm. And economics in itself won't change moral attitudes, and that's somehow where we have to get to. And reinforcing multiculturalism, is this the way forward? Well, the overarching difficult. question behind uh, No, I don't think so. I, I, I think that w I celebrate my Scottish culture, but that doesn't mean okay. so you're not going to be British. <laughs> or a Scott Nath, heaven help us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, that's it for this week from our panel, Ian Hargreaves, Janet Daly, David Starkey, David Cook, and from me. Until the same time next week, goodbye. The Moral Maze was presented by Michael Burke and produced by David Coombs. Well, are we on the brink of a new gold rush? Peter Evans joins the quest to explore the seabed's riches in Digging Deep, tonight's edition of Frontiers, after the news at two minutes past nine.